Thanks very much for asking me to come. I thought what would be very helpful is for me to talk about uh, or to try and bust some of the myths around the COVID vaccine because there's lots of stuff going around on social media. Um, I get a lot of questions, so I thought it's important to try and uh, dispel some of the myths that are floating around there. Before I start, I would like to wish everybody though a very happy Christmas. We're coming into that season and we're all looking forward to a much better year next year in 2021 than we've had this year. I think probably the weirdest myth that I've seen out there is that the pandemic is not there and it's just a conspiracy. I really can't understand that one because there are so many um, incredibly bright minds, I'm not including myself here by any means, but so many incredibly bright minds of scientists, uh, politicians, um, high profile people who've had to turn all of their attentions in order to try and fight this pandemic and get it under control so that hopefully the world will be able to um, come out of this the other side. We've seen so many deaths. I mean, who, who, who would ever wish this to happen again? Clearly it's happened before. It probably will happen again. But um, I can't understand why anybody would say it's a, con it's a conspiracy, um, uh, but that, that, that it just it is, is a total and utter fallacy. I've heard before that um, vaccines aren't safe because they've been developed very quickly. And um, one of the reasons for this is that funding gets released. We saw when there was the Ebola crisis that when it became a public health emergency of international concern, funding was released and that enabled people to work towards a vaccine much faster. Here, funding was available immediately for this, relatively immediately for this um, public health emergency. And it meant that people could do things that are not normally possible, such as to stack different parts of trials on top of each other so they could run things concurrently, which they'd normally do in sequence. But instead, they were able to do all of the things at the steps at the same time, as well as work on some vaccines that may likely fail, but they had the seed funding available to in order to, to start work on them. Um, in addition to that, you were able to start to manufacture vaccines right at the beginning of the process that you thought were likely, um, even though the trials hadn't yet been completed. So a lot of different steps led to the, the speed. Um, another factor is um, many of the agencies that are reviewing the information about um, the studies, the um, um, uh, practical data, the, the study data that comes out, were able to do this in a rolling way rather than do it all as a bunch, uh, you know, receive a huge bunch of papers. They're working on the data as they received it so that they're able to arrive at their decision fairly quickly. Um, to say that, f particularly for the Pfizer vaccine, that it's only been tested in 43,000 people, to say that's a small number, I think is, uh, uh, is not true. 43,000 people to have tried a drug is huge. There are many drugs in the world that have been tried on hundreds of people or even less depending on, 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 on the pool of people that are going to use this drug. So that's a huge number that have, that have, that have gone through the, the, the stage three safety in the previous trials. Um, it, it's, it's great. Not only that, but in the United Kingdom, um, I know at the end of last week and now we're at the end of the second week, they'd given something like 130,000 vaccines. So that number is probably at least doubled by now. Um, and it's been approved right around the world. And we've seen on all the TV that um, uh, uh, Biden took the vaccine, that, that the US is starting to use it, and that many other countries of the world have approved it. Singapore, Saudi Arabia, the European Union, I think yesterday, um, Canada, and so on. So that's a lot of confidence that all of the separate um, public health agencies and agencies that supervise vaccines have looked at the study data and said, this is safe. We're good to go. A lot of very, very professional people with um, good scientific heads on their shoulders. We've also heard that um, concerns about DNA being adjusted by, um, by uh, an mRNA, which stands for messenger RNA vaccine, which is both the um, Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine that we, we believe we're going to be receiving. Um, that's not true. Um, what happens is that an mRNA vaccine is really a message. So it's like you receiving a letter or a message, it comes through to your own cells and it says to the cell, make some of the protein that looks a little bit like the coronavirus 
And so then your own cell make, looks a little bit like the coronavirus, but it doesn't make you sick. And then your body's own immune system fights that cell and knows how to fight it in the future. The mRNA itself, which is the messenger, actually gets destroyed really quickly. So um, it doesn't stay around in your body for very long, and it certainly doesn't have the ability to change your own DNA. That's, that, that's just not, not possible with this particular type of technology. There are different types of technologies that are in, involved, but all of them don't um, change your own DNA. Um, that would obviously be of, of, of significant concern if it did. And um, that's one of the things that you look at in early studies of any type of technology. And the mRNA technology, although it's new to the vaccine field, has actually been studied for well over a decade in itself in use for other things, for example, in, in cancer therapies. I've heard that it might cause long-term side effects, and that's obviously of a concern. We know that short-term side effects certainly are present. So some people may experience fatigue or a headache or muscle pains, but these are all short-lived. And it seems that if you're older, you're much less likely to have these side effects. Um, and certainly the second time around, you're, you're, you, you, you're, you're less likely to have the side effects. But um, the, um, as far as longer-term side effects are concerned, infertility and sterility are very unlikely, but it is possible to be categoric because I would be telling a lie. We've only had the vaccines around for a few months. Um, I would take it straight away because I just would never want to either suffer with COVID myself um, or transmit it to somebody that I loved and have them suffer. Not only because it's been killing hundreds of thousands and we know the numbers all around the world, um, but it's also causing longer term symptoms in some people. So what we've heard of as long COVID symptoms of possibly as a result of end organ damage where people have difficulty breathing, they have extreme fatigue, lethargy, um, and they just can't get back to their previous cells before they had COVID, is, la can be, is, is lasting now for months and may last for, for even longer than that. And that does not sound like um, something we'd wish on anybody. So I would absolutely take the vaccine in order to protect myself and to protect the people that I love and to protect the community in general. I think it's it's the right thing to do. And um, um, I believe that the effects of COVID far outweigh any potential side effects that we may see further down the line from the vaccine. As time goes along, for example, if we needed to subtly tweak it because there was a variant that we needed to attend to, Pfizer said the other day that that could be done within six weeks. So a very quick and easy thing to do subject to the regulatory authorities saying it, it, it could be done. Um, we've heard about mutations and it's, it's a really big worry that um, the United Kingdom have picked up this mutation of the coronavirus in the southeast of England, um, which has also appeared in a few other countries, but there is quite a strong uh, emphasis on genomic testing to monitor the different types of strains that are there. There have been multiple strains of COVID that have emerged throughout the pandemic. And some of these have had more potency in terms of causing illness than others. Um, that, that is known. This one, in fact, does not seem to, the current one that we're talking about, the variant that is a cause of concern in, in, in the middle of late of December, which was first discovered a, a few months ago, does not seem to cause any worse sickness or any increase in uh, death rates, which is good news, but it does seem to be more infectious. That final point is yet to be proven, but things are suggesting that, pointing us in that direction. We have lived with influenza for hundreds of years. Um, the reason that it's such a successful virus is the fact that it is able to mutate very quickly. This particular coronavirus does not seem to mutate as much, although I have to tell you, I'm not a virologist, but that's my understanding. However, we certainly have seen mutations, there is no question. The fact that we have this new vaccine technology that can be changed relatively quickly to give something that's efficacious, or that's at least what we're being advised, the mRNA type vaccines, means that we have the ability perhaps 
to have to be a step ahead of this particular virus. So I'm hoping we will be able to get it really well under control. To say we can eliminate it is something that I can't say with confidence. We have been trying, for example, to eliminate polio for decades. We have almost got rid of it around the world, but it remains present in, I think, three countries in the world. Um, so there are things we have not been able to get rid of, and there are things that we currently control with vaccinations, polio, measles. We control it because it, they're so infectious, they manage to stay alive. We don't vaccinate enough people, but we control it and we live with it quite successfully. It could well be that we come to a stage where we live with this coronavirus quite successfully, but we need to continue to take active measures, for example, vaccinations, in order to keep it at bay. In Cayman, we're really lucky that we have a, system, a very strong system for protecting our borders from infections, stronger than in many other countries, in that we have, um, not only do we test people on arrival, um, we test people on exit from quarantine, and many people don't have that. We have a full 14-day quarantine period, which is the safest period to have. Um, and um, we have very strong surveillance around the people that are in quarantine. So not only do we have the geofencing bracelets, but we also have physical checks, telephone checks, and so on. We all accept there have been some breaches. There will always be people that break the rules. Um, that is why tougher penalties have been introduced to really encourage people and say this is really something we do not want to see you doing. So the $10,000 fine, the up to two years imprisonment, uh, much stronger deterrence we hope um, to try to get people to comply um, with the advice so that we can protect our, our, our people. When the vaccine arrives we'll also be making sure that Port workers, people at the airport, people that handle the visitors are one of the first groups to be vaccinated in order to help protect us from any spread of any incoming virus. And um, we're well aware that the next British Airways plane that, uh, that's to arrive is, is two weeks away. So the periods of lockdown that they're having um, in the United Kingdom now, currently a strong period of lockdown to try and prevent the spread of this, this, this new variant. And also the lockdowns that have been instituted for countries um, that receive direct flights from the United Kingdom will probably all have ended by that period of time because um, two weeks is a long time and gives us gives gives time for the for the viral levels to drop. But we'll we will always be on alert to this. Um, we don't have a genomic sequencer on Ireland. It's a it's a, a it's a relatively expensive and. Um, um, complicated bit of technology, but I can tell you one is on its way. So um, just to be clear on that point, um, the Pfizer vaccine does not have any fetal tissue in it. We have seen all the ingredients on the list um, and it does not contain that. One thing it does contain is a glycol type component, um, which is a chemical which is used for uh, improving stability. And I'm sure you can understand a lot of these drugs need to have things added to improve their stability in order that they can last a long time, be transported, be stored, so on and so forth. It, it, it's also possible, we've also heard that there have been some major reactions. A, a, a few people around the world have had um, uh, uh, allergic reactions to the Pfizer vaccine. There were two people who were known to be severely allergic and already carried the uh, adrenaline or EpiPen type thing to, to help them with any allergy. And it's possible that it's this glycol compound that, that caused that because it is known to occasionally produce allergic reactions. In any event, as a result of this, the MHRA, the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Authority in the, in the United Kingdom have issued a statement saying that anybody who's had an immediate anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine to a food substance or to a medication should not receive this vaccine. The other groups that have been excluded, and it's not really because they are, it's a, what we call a contraindication, it's really because they haven't adequately been tested, is any children under the age of 16, because they haven't really been adequately tested in that group, and again, in, in women who are pregnant or expecting to become pregnant. There's no um, 
belief that there would be a problem. So if you happen to be pregnant but didn't know about it and received the vaccine, it's not expected that anything should happen, that there should no, be any deleterious consequences to that. It's just it hasn't actually been tested. And as we go along with time, there will be more vaccines that come out that have been specifically tested in these groups. And so we look forward to that, particularly as we move into 2021, when people will want to take the vaccine, but they feel that, that they're in, that, you know, they may want for children to have it, or they may want um, pregnant women to have it and so on, to, to, to afford them that, that surety and safety of, of the vaccine. With this vaccine, there will need to be two doses. The reason we have this two dose is after the first dose, you do develop some immunity, um, but it's even more strengthened with that second dose. The Pfizer vaccine requires to be given 21 days apart. Um, and so we would encourage people to make sure they come forward for their second dose. Um, there has been a discussion that people with underlying health conditions shouldn't get the vaccine, whether they're immunocompromised and have cancer and so on and so forth. But actually the information that's come out from the Joint Commission on Immunization and Vaccination from the United Kingdom, which is the body that's advised on how it should be used, have said absolutely a lot of the at-risk groups or all of the at-risk groups should come forward for the vaccination. It is possible that in some in people with immune um, deficiencies or in immune suppression, the vaccine may not work as well. It may not have such a good response if your immune system has been suppressed, but it depends a little bit on your particular circumstance and your doctor should be able to advise if that's the case. Um, but you should certainly come forward and take the vaccine because it will give you, afford you better protection from the potential of, of getting COVID. There is a, a long list of the people they particularly feel fall into this category which include people with diabetes, people who have known to have heart conditions, um, people who've had organ transplants, people who are immunocompromised for whatever reason. And, and the list is quite long and I don't have it in, in front of me to go through it, but it is there on the, um, on the websites for us to see. On the issue of websites, I would encourage anybody who wants further information to have a look at the government's website on the vaccine. It can be found at gov.ky forward slash um, coronavirus and under the FAQs you'll find a section devoted to vaccines. There's a, a video me talking about vaccines from a few weeks ago and then a whole list of questions with answers that have been tailored particularly to the Cayman population and we're adding to that, developing it, changing it all the while so it's a, it's a dynamic document rather than one that is static. As far as um, protection, once you've had the vaccine, there remains the question around the world, it's not just for Cayman, as to whether you can continue to be infectious from the virus. And we don't simply don't know that yet. But what we need to do is to get all of our vulnerable vaccinated because once those have been vaccinated, all of the effort and time we have taken over the last months to protect the population will then be given to them in an even stronger format in that it's an individual protection. So that vaccine is giving them the individual protection against COVID. Um, and as we work through the stages, we will be giving it not only to the people that are the most vulnerable, but also to the people in their household. And eventually we wish to, to vaccinate all of the eligible population of Cayman. The reason I say eligible is that currently, as we heard earlier, um, we are not vaccinating people who have had a, 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 an immediate um, anaphylactic reaction to a medicine, a vaccination, or a food substance. And those people will probably be identified by having, by carrying an, an adrenaline or an EpiPen with them. We're also not vaccinating women who are pregnant or um, trying to get pregnant, or children under 16 at the minute. You will therefore see around the world people still requesting um, you to wear masks in public spaces and distancing should there be known to be COVID in that particular country. And whilst we remain um, with no community spread of COVID to the best of our knowledge in Cayman, we, all can, we are in the unenviable position and it really is unenviable. I mean, what a, what a time people are having around the world and how we will be able to enjoy families at Christmas time is, is quite something. So whilst we have 
no community spread of COVID here in Cayman. Um, we don't have to do that. But should there be a, uh, an outbreak, we may have to consider reverting to that in order to protect us until we have better understanding of the amount of protection it gets from passing any infection on, even if you have been vaccinated. That is a question that is yet to be answered. We've been having a lot of meetings with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office um, in the UK th through the Governor's Office about the timing of the arrival of the vaccines and we believe they're going to arrive on the British Airways flight on the 5th of January so it's really exciting that we're, we're, we're sharing a launch date so to speak. Um, it's going to take a couple of days for the vaccine to settle down to the right temperatures in the freezer. It, it can only be moved a certain number of times from the time that it leaves the factory to the time it hits um, the country that's receiving it. Um, the manufacturer Pfizer have said it can only move four times and because of its journey to from I think the factories in Belgium to the United Kingdom and then to Cayman, the last journey that is permissible for it under the um, uh, manufacturer's requirements is the one that, to get to our freezer. So it will arrive in our freezers and then a couple of days after that we will begin the vaccination program according to the stages that have been previously given by the Premier. Um, I expect we will receive enough vaccines to have a good start at our most vulnerable groups, which will be the most elderly. So we may not go down to as far as 60, but we may well be able to do 70 and above, for example plus some people in particularly vulnerable health groups, the port workers, for obvious reasons, because they receive a lot of the people coming through the, the airport, and, and healthcare workers and those in institutions like nursing, nursing care homes and so on. So I'm expecting a good proportion of those people will be done, and that'll be great news. After that, we don't have a confirmed dose for our next um, set of vaccines, but I'm imagining that the availability of vaccine will become a lot easier as we move through the first quarter of 2021, um, especially with the Moderna vaccine now getting FDA approval, as well as we're anticipating the AstraZeneca vaccine, which works in a slightly different way, will get approval as well, hopefully um, uh, imminently, um, maybe. Uh, before the end of the year, but certainly in the in, in, in the first few weeks of 2021. Lastly, I'd just like to say again, I wish you all a really happy Christmas and we hope for a very good 2021.